Our first panel is Lessons Learned from the 20 and 2022 Elections. So I'd like to welcome to the stage first my friend and co-author, uh, CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett. Major, come on up. Paige Alexander, the CEO of the Carter Center. Justin Levitt, Professor of Law at Loyola University School of Law. Charles Stewart, Professor of Political Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And shortly, they will be also joined, oh wait, one more, Stephanie Thomas, Secretary of State of Connecticut. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, lastly, we will be joined by Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger of Georgia. His flight was a little bit delayed, so he'll be joining us shortly. So welcome and take it away, Major. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, Brad will be making a dramatic entrance at any moment, so make sure you are emotionally prepared for that. Exactly. Um, I want to get started right off the top, and we'll start here with Paige, and we'll go straight down. Uh, 2020 was a traumatic event for the country, and there were a lot of... Uh, projections about what would happen in the midterms, some of which were realized, some of which were not. But the first question I want to ask everyone on this panel is, net-net, after the midterms, are you net optimistic about where this is all going or pessimistic? Paige, let's start with you. Uh, this an easy one. Uh, no, uh, I'm optimistic, but because you wouldn't be in this business if you weren't optimistic, it would be difficult to continue doing the work that we do. Um, you know, we have learned that the Carter Center got involved in U.S. domestic election work because we've done this overseas in 40 different countries, and we see similarities that we felt needed to be addressed. And uh, I think we are learning and iterating as we go. I think all of us are as to what levers need to be pulled in terms of making this a free, fair, transparent uh, set of elections. And so I'm optimistic. Let me stop you right there, because I do think that is a moment worth pausing to consider. The Carter Center now involving itself in observations of US elections. Did you imagine that would ever come to be? And why did you feel it was necessary to start now? Well, when President Carter started the Carter Center 40 years ago, the intent was to just work internationally, you know, one president at a time, and that's what he believed. Uh, I started, I came into town in 2020. I took this job. I had been living overseas. And to see the, the political polarization that had happened while I was overseas, in, happening in Georgia in particular, I went down and talked to him in Plains and just said, you know, we're not going to be credible overseas if we're not looking in our own backyard. And so that's why we ended up getting involved. I don't, you know, he, I also said, what are you saving your money for? And he said, a rainy day. And I was like, it's <laughs> pouring outside. There's no way that we can not sort of address and jump in. So we jumped in in 2020 looking at the same polarization that we had seen overseas that got us involved in elections. But in the United States, you know, unlike overseas, you have a National Election Commission. You work with one Central Election Commission. In the US, I mean, even in Georgia, 159 different counties, there are different rules for many of those counties. And Stephanie and I were just talking about, you know, Connecticut's one of four states that doesn't have early voting. Like, so every single state is different. So to work in four states for us is like working in four countries. So um, yeah, it seemed necessary. So President Carter was supportive, and that's why we're involved. Justin. Thank you, Major. And thank you to David and CEIR. Um, I have a very similar answer to Paige. I consider myself a civil rights lawyer by training. And we are steeped in living amongst the worst of the worst. And some of us get incredibly excited for really bad fact patterns, because that makes a really great case. <laughs> so you won't find a, a broader group of cynics out there in the world. And yet, like Paige, we wouldn't be doing this work, none of us, if we weren't fundamentally optimistic in the long run. And so I, I have no illusions about the troubles ahead, which I think will mirror some of the troubles behind, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I also have fundamental faith in the majority of human nature that people ultimately want a democracy that responds to them. And we ultimately have agency in that process to both create and keep a democracy that responds to the people and I think it's going to take a lot of work, including a lot of work by a lot of people in this room. But yes, I'm optimistic 
that we will continue to get there. As, as David mentioned, the graph's going in the right direction. I mean, if you look over the history of the US at the percentage of adult citizens who are participating in the electoral process, it's only going up and to the right, which is exactly where it should be. And you'd rather be living today than 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Doesn't mean there aren't bumps ahead, but I'm optimistic. Charles, many of us in this room uh, rely on the data sets you provide and the analysis that you add to that data. Mm -hmm. Your optimism, pessimism, sir. Well. Um, I'm, I'm usually the optimist on the panel, so I'm glad to see I'm not the only optimist on the panel. Um, and I think, um, and all of us are optimistic. Uh, we'll have to see how Stephanie is, but <laughs> I have an idea. Um, because of you know, the, the facts about the 2020 and 22 election, and that's you know, the MIT election data and science lab. We, um, elections generate a lot of data, and you know, the data usually are used to determine who the winners are, but data um, is also generated that tells us about how the election was, was, was administered. And in 2020, and 2020, particularly amidst the pandemic, all of the metrics pointed in the same direction, which is to say that despite the fact, for instance, that um, there was a tsunami wave of absentee and mail ballots, we saw historic low levels of rejected mail ballots. And we saw um, election officials and voters pivot and learn how to do a new thing. Um, and um, so by most of the metrics, in 2020, things went well. Um, the survey that I run of voters after every federal election had the same results. Um, so all of that's good. 2022 was also good, although the data are still coming in. And I think we have to remember that, the, that a midterm election doesn't have the same strains that a presidential election is, and so we shouldn't get um, you know, we shouldn't, you know, kind of rest on our laurels from 22. Um, but also the data tell me where to be concerned. So in 22, we saw, for instance, the trust in, in, in most states in the electoral outcomes improving and digging down. Um, it improved mostly because in most states, Republicans got more trusting. But there are still a few states, and you can probably guess which those are, in which trust hasn't come back. And so not only, I mean, we can, there, there's the platitude that, you know, we're, we're not out of the woods yet, we always have work to do. But in, in addition to that, which is true, there are particular places where I'm looking, um, still not concerned about the election administration in those states, but knowing that there's a special work to be done in some states in dealing with simmering levels of, of mistrust. The good news is that in some of the states we were worried about in 2020, Things are not as bad, at least at the, at the mass level, but um, you know, things are still festering. And Secretary Thomas, in addition to the pessimism, optimism answer, I'd also like you to share your story because you're someone who's recently involved in this process. You looked at something and said, I wanna join, I wanna get involved. So your story is recent and part of this entire conversation at a deeply personal level. There's a dramatic entrance of Brad Raffensperger, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We'll get to you in a minute, Secretary. <laughs> sure, good. Talk about time. Secretary Thomas, please. I am literally a doubting Thomas, but I am optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to your point, part of my optimism comes from other people like me. Um, I was never involved in politics, and in 2016, I just started getting more involved in my town. I did some local service. I ran for the state house in 2020, and I won. And in my first term, um, our secretary declined to run again, so I ran, and I won, and here I am. <laughs> um, so the optimism, or the, the reason for my optimism is I look to the people, and I have never seen I think many of us took our democracy for granted and we just thought it was gonna work <laughs> and run seamlessly. Um, but now I see people in every town across my state wanting to learn more. I see people understanding, as David alluded, everyone just thought an election happens <laughs> and that there weren't people working all year. So to have a seat in demystifying that process, teaching people about civics is the root, uh, the reason for my optimism. So I feel good. What's the atmosphere in Connecticut on this question? 
believability of elections, functionality, et cetera? Like everywhere, it's mixed. Um, people consider Connecticut a blue state, but I would say outside of a few cities, it's very purple. Um, so we certainly um, have election deniers, naysayers, and whatnot, but I think um, the good old New England uh, reasonability, <laughs> um, you know, I think if you share the data, um, and let them know how things really work. They're appreciative and uh, hopefully ask me again in 2024, but hopefully <laughs> we're going in the right direction. Excellent. Secretary Raffensperger, the question is, after the 2022 midterm, optimistic, pessimistic about the direction of this debate, believability, trustworthiness, and functionality of elections? In Georgia, I think it's positive. Uh, but I did do a town hall with you mm -hmm. in Arizona. Yeah. And I just felt that I was back in about November 15th, 2020. Yeah. And it's just really, I guess, the dynamics there. I think that one of the benefits of having a governor and your secretary of state running for re-election, so they're out there talking to everyone, I think that's really good because then you're engaging with the voters, answering their questions, giving them the facts. And I think that's really the opportunity that you know Governor Kemp and I had you know, at the, during the re-election. And unfortunately, the governor in Arizona was term limited, so you know he wasn't out there making that case, and then it was really uh, got down to lower level election officials, and uh, they do the best they can. They just don't have as big a megaphone as your governor does. Mm -hmm. Would you say the temperature about election denialism has gone down in Georgia? Yes. It's not as big a problem as it was, say, two yeah. years ago. I feel people feel comfortable because no matter how you want to vote in Georgia, it's based on photo ID. We think that really elevates security, but also it also provides confidence. And number one thing I think we need to, at all levels of government, is wherever we can look to increase trust. And if it doesn't do anything to really take away from the accessibility of the ballot, but actually can elevate trust, we think that's a good thing. And tell this audience, Secretary Raffensperger, about the post-2022 voter experience data you have. Well, post-2022 uh, experience is that we kept lines short, which was actually something we put into state law because, because counties actually determine the number of precincts you have, how much equipment you have, but we've worked with the counties. But then we put, actually got that put into state law, and we kept lines on election day you know, under virtually an hour of just about everywhere, so it was very, very successful. You know, a few times at 7 a.m., you have a few lines, but we worked through those. So we had a great voter experience. We're very voter-centric. Uh, we also had tremendous turnout. If you look at the census, uh, the federal government just put out data, and that 82% of all you know, active registered voters voted in the state of Georgia. So really high marks for voter participation also. And I know that that law encountered quite a bit of criticism. Do you feel that the experience and the data vindicates that law? Well, it's pretty obvious that if you live in the world of facts, yes, it does. <laughs> and that's the world that I think any Secretary of State should live in. Is that, a, from your perspective, Secretary, a cautionary tale about when legislatures change laws, uh, the debate about those laws and their real-world effect can be overhyped at the front front well, end? Well, they obviously were, were because we lost an all-star game over it. But if you really look at what that law do, SB 202, the Election Integrity Act, we put in photo ID for all forms of voting. Many people don't realize that we've been sued by a political party. Guess which one? Mm -hmm. Both of them both the Democrat and the Republican, and they both of them said it was subjective. So we put in objective criteria, which is what Minnesota had been doing for over 10 years. Many people aren't aware of that if you're not in Minnesota. But Nebraska and Kansas use that same procedure, and we like that we've done that, so we take that off the table and we have objective criteria. We added an additional day of early voting. They said that we took something away. Well, there were, all, there were probably at least 50 different bills that were working their way through the system, and they didn't see the time of day. They didn't even get committee hearing meetings, but what did pass was 17 days of early voting. And then we worked to make sure that lines stayed short. So every single data point proves that it was never easier to vote. We had record turnout, and so we're just really grateful. And people had a good experience. When you keep lines short, that is probably one of the most things. People, yes, people need it to be accurate, and they want to get their results quickly, and we did that also, but they like short lines. Charles, I want to ask you about what the data tell us, which is, as you mentioned, high turnout in recent elections. That's one dimension of consumer satisfaction. You're showing up. Right. And generally, when voters are asked what their experience has, generally speaking, their experience has been positive. Right. 
So you have these two very large metrics on the positive side of things. Right. And yet there is as high a percentage of Americans as ever been doubting the validity of elections. Mm -hmm. so, so you would think they would be, if you doubt them, you don't participate. No, you participate, you say you have a good experience, but then you doubt. Is there any way to reconcile that contradiction? Well, one of the ways to reconcile it is to be very precise about what we mean when we are measuring voter confidence. So um, the first thing to say is that the metrics about the voter experience um, have moved very little. Um, so um, both um, in terms of, you know, just your, when we ask people about their experience in the voting place, but that, and then at the end when we ask, do you trust that your vote was counted as, as cast, there's a similar set of questions that are asked. They're about as high as they've ever been. The, the, the issue comes when you start asking about, well, what about your county? What about your state? What about nationwide? And um, that's where we've seen the SAG. And um, in political science, I mean, to, for a political scientist, it's pretty clear why this is happening, and the, other, and the research has borne this out, which is to say most people don't know about election administration, right? They know what they know. And um, that um, they rely on trusted others, usually politicians, but can be other folks, to interpret the larger world to, to them. And so over the past couple of years, what we've discovered, um, not surprisingly, is that election administration has become a salient, um, has become a salient issue. And a large number of voters were hearing how horrible things were um, maybe not in this state, although in some states that was what was being said. But also, well, things are fine here, but look at what they're doing over there mm. and how horrible things are over there. Um, we already knew that voters in general are very comfortable with how they vote. And if you run by them how, how folks vote in other states, um, you will oftentimes get that, yeah, you know, they vote by mail there, or they have to show voter ID, or they don't have to show voter ID. All these are things are mysterious beyond where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that you know, certainly in 2016, we saw a little bit of this in 2020. By nationalizing the issue, um, a large number of voters are now listening to national politicians about, in general, how things are going, but also they're seeing expectations about how elections should be run more nationalized. The final thing I'll say is that this is not unique in election administration. This is happening in public health, this is happening in education, yep. you can go down the line. So I think as we think about these issues in the election space, we should be aware that this is, you know, our, our friends and colleagues in these other areas are experiencing exactly the same thing. And I think we can learn something um, from those areas as well. Paige, from the Carter Center's perspective, when you're looking at elections in America, uh, as compared to the way you look at them internationally, and oftentimes internationally, you're going to a place that has no democratic experience, or they're trying to stand it up for the first time. And so many of the things are mysterious, and the basic core functionality has to be addressed. Do we have, from the Carter Center's perspective, a functionality problem in America, or just a confidence problem? I think we have an education problem. I think the, the confidence is lacking, one, because as Charles just said, when it's moved to a national level, you don't have neighbors talking to neighbors about things. You have this taken out of that, uh, that sort of echo chamber of trusted individuals who are explaining this. Uh, so, you know, I, many of you probably remember the, the videos that we saw, Schoolhouse Rocks and things like that, which taught us how things worked back in the day. So I think it's an education component that if people understood, if they were made aware of what the steps were, then they would recognize. I mean, it's fact-based, as we had talked about. Uh, so we see this overseas. We want people to trust the people in their neighborhood to tell them about the voting and how it's done. So I think it's confidence, but I think it's also uh, an education component. Justin, I want to ask you about something that I frequently encounter when I talk to people who still have doubts about the 2020 election. They will say, because they've heard it or they read it somewhere, well, the, all these affidavits were filed. Those people would not have lied about what they saw. They swore under oath. Those affidavits have legal merit. They weren't seriously considered. And that's why I still doubt this election. 
Yeah, um, it, it turns out. Jump into that space if you'd be so kind. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, filing a lawsuit is essentially nothing more than a tweet with a filing fee. <laughs> that if you a tweet with a filing fee. Write that down, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, please. And people don't realize. It, it used to be that if a lawsuit were filed, that must mean that there's something to it, that there's some there there. And we saw an unprecedented attack on the 2020 elections and on the election system by using this thing that people trust, the legal system will work its way out, as a method of casting doubt because people's instinct, for very good reason, is you're not allowed to file a lawsuit if there's not any there there. Well, it turns out hmm. that you are, in fact, allowed to file a lawsuit if there's not any there there. And we are now coming to what I hope is a cycle of accountability for people whose professional licenses depend on ensuring that there's there there when you file a lawsuit. When courts across the country, and this has to be said over and over and over again, did see, did hear the evidence, found the evidence grotesquely lacking, not on procedural nitty gritty, not on technical violations, not on uh, the sort of legal games that people can sometimes see, but on the merits said, give us the evidence that there was some problem here and found there's nothing that holds up. There's a lot of smoke and very, very, very little fire. I understand that people want to have confidence in the piece of paper, but the thing you can have confidence in is the system that evaluates the piece of paper. And that stood up actually, again, I have policy disagreements with many of the uh, rulings, mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that we know from the 2020 election, as David said, is the most scrutinized in history, and the courts acted spectacularly as courts. That wasn't something that I think we all necessarily should have expected. It was wonderfully heartwarming, just as election officials across the country did a remarkable job of holding the line in 2020. The courts acted as courts, Republican appointee, Democratic appointee, elected judge, nonpartisan judge across the board said, show me the law, show me the facts, I will assess whether you've actually got a case. And across the board said, no. Just let me pick up on that for a minute, because I think in my industry, we sometimes do a disservice to this country by describing at the federal level, certainly, ex-appointed judge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, leaving the audience with the impression that that judge appointed by that president at that particular time is going to rule a certain way. Just remind our audience, Justin, if you'd be so kind, because uh, if I remember from my reading, some of the harshest assessments of cases brought in this space came from Trump-appointed judges. Correct. That's absolutely right. And I think across the board. That's what the law said. The judges looked to the law and looked to the facts that were presented to them and then asked, are there any more facts that we're not hearing? Give plenty of opportunity for people to come forward with actual facts and found at every stage that there was conspiracy, there was wild prognostication, there were assumptions being made that didn't hold up. But as all of the election officials here know, the things that were being described was not how the election actually worked. Um, a lot of it had to do with either misunderstanding or willful misunderstanding, or assumptions that something had to work one way in X jurisdiction because they naturally work that way in Y jurisdiction. But the judges of any partisan stripe and none, I mean, the fact that you're appointed by a particular president doesn't mean that you're a diehard partisan in that role. When you put on the robe, it's a very different way to experience the world. And across the board in 2020, judges put on their robes, and again, I don't agree with every decision, but they across the board, evaluated facts and law. And yes, you're absolutely right that some of the judges who were appointed by one of the biggest contestants in the 2020 election were not shy about expressing their view about the lack of merit behind some of the claims. Secretary Thomas, I want to talk about the practicalities of your job. Um, it's been my experience that secretaries of state, where they have a strong election administration uh, obligation, have not always had a forward-facing comms shop. They haven't thought about the, they just basically take care of the election and not orient themselves either to the pre-election communication with voters unless asked. 
and don't have a large infrastructure afterwards. Attorneys generals do because that's a very ambitious post. It's a stepping stone to something else. Governors clearly do. Um, are you changing or is your office changing in preparation of that as you talk to other secretaries of state? Is this now much more a fundamental part of the job? I think that's a nice way of saying secretaries are under-resourced and <laughs> underfunded. Um, we certainly have the smallest staff amongst our executive branch. Um, and, you know, I took office in January and budgets were already set. Um, so I find myself fighting the legislature, trying to get public education money, which has never been part of our funded budget. Um, so I do think it's changing. Our legislature um, has certainly had many vocal advocates on our elections committee saying that we need to make sure we can educate people around how elections work. We need additional staff in our office to deal with the onslaught of FOIA requests. Um, and across the board, they are fighting for that funding. Um, and I come from a nonprofit fundraising background, so I believe in guerrilla tactics and grassroots tactics. So I am trying to find as many trusted messengers as possible to help deliver that message. At the end of last week, I just announced a program. We're calling it our CEO program, civically engaged organizations. And we're asking businesses, nonprofits, churches to take the pledge and adhere to about six points to help educate their employees and customers about when elections are coming, um, to uh, disseminate toolkits about how government works, how their voice can be heard, entirely nonpartisan. But um, I'm trying to be really smart about collaborations to help get the message out there so that people, you know, I think people distrust what they don't know. Um, so the more I can have these messages coming neighbor to neighbor instead of secretary to constituent, I think we'll be better served. Secretary Raffensperger, you mentioned something that the two of us and David and uh, Bill Gates, the other Bill Gates <laughs> uh, in Maricopa <laughs> County participated in in Arizona the day after the Super Bowl. And just to briefly summarize for the audience, uh, it was a focus group that was done. You can watch it on YouTube. Frank Luntz was the moderator of 17 election rejectionists who all participated uh, voluntarily uh, in this focus group. Uh, there were 90 Arizona State University students in, in a live audience. When we uh, put the program together, we imagined it would be a one hour focus group and then an hour discussion afterwards. Now we did two full hours on every question that came up about elections 2020 and 2022. And Secretary Raffensperger, I want to ask you your takeaway from that experience because it was clear after two hours of conversation, it wasn't hostile, it wasn't confrontational, that no one's mind was changed. Mm -hmm. That this was deeply embedded skepticism or full-blown suspicion. It was a free flow of ideas and exchanges, but we didn't move, or nothing moved. I didn't go there with the intent of moving anything. I just wanted to see what it was about. Secretary Raffensperger, what was your takeaway from that experience? Well, I think that in many cases, the misinformation, disinformation has just been baked in to people's DNA. And also, people want to lean into what they're hoping is that, you know, their facts. And they just have trouble accepting that reality. I would hope that with the lawsuit between Fox and Dominion, that then people can finally put to bed and accept that the machines are accurate. So let's take that off the table. But when we were out there, people talked about, you know, uh, suitcases underneath the table. Well, what they were talking about, I could tell, was Fulton County. And that's been investigated by our investigators who are post-certified, the GBI, who are post-certified, the FBI. And when you say that to a Tea Party group, guess what they say? Well, you can't trust the FBI. And we all chuckle there in the meeting. But then I say, guess who actually looked at it? President Trump handpicked Bobby Christine, the U.S. attorney of the Southern District came up to Atlanta, replaced B.J. Pack, and he became the acting U.S. Attorney. He specifically looked into that, and he found nothing there. But that, that's all out there, but that's after that urban legend has gotten out there, and it's just really baked into people's uh, DNA because they want to believe. And that's the challenge that you have. People want to believe. What they really need to understand is what happened in Georgia, and it may have happened in other states. In Georgia, 24,000 people just skipped the presidential race. 
They couldn't vote for any one of those three folks that were up at the top of the ticket, and yet they voted down ballot in the other races. Highly unusual. And it was highly unusual because I've been down ballot all my life. And, <laughs> and, and so, uh, trust me, when you run for city council and you win a race and there's only six to eight percent of the people that turn out, that's not a mandate. So you know, keep your ego in check. But when you run for the state house in a special election like uh, I did, I, first election, then you kind of understand that people just don't come out for certain races. The presidential top of the ticket, then the U.S. senator and governor. Those are the big, one, big ones, obviously. Yeah, 24,000 skipped the presidential race. And that's why I believe President Trump came up short, because the state house and the state senators all scored about five to six percent more than President Trump did. And our Republican congressmen in Georgia collectively got 33,000 more votes than President Trump. On this panel, you're Secretary Raffensperger, the one person who can speak to my next question directly, which is the pull within Republican Party conversations about what to say about the 2020 election. And I ask because just before we walked up here, a sitting Secretary of State in West Virginia was quoted as saying he's now convinced the 2020 election was stolen. It is a lure in Republican Party politics, is it not, within a primary conversation to deny the results of the 2020 election? Well, the challenge that people have is most people don't want to face the brutal truth. But if you read any business book, number one, you got to face the brutal truth. You know? And so I've read Good to Great. You know, I did cliff notes on it because I've had some business setbacks and I had to face the brutal truth. And if we keep on doing what we're doing, we're going to keep on getting what we've been getting. I didn't like it. And so I figured that I need to figure out the path forward. But I think what people uh, want to do is they want to say, well, if it wasn't in Georgia, then we're, it had to have been in Michigan. And yet you had a, a Republican state senator that did a 60-page report, I believe it's that, mm -hmm. then published it you know, at great cost and a lot of consternation he got from blowback in his party. But he looked into that. He was looking for fraud. He was looking for everything. And he said at the end of the day, these were the right results. And so that's published, and that was a state senate report, and it was... 3-1, I believe it was, three Republicans, one Democrat that sat on that special committee to look into that. So every state has done that. I can just speak to Georgia. But what I really believe is, at the end of the day, what you saw is that in many states, just a lot of people left the top of the ticket blank. And I think that goes to a bigger issue. We just pull it back to the cob and call it like it is. Both people and both parties, Republicans and Democrats, we're looking for our next great leader. Because I think when we look at the top of the ticket, we're saying, I don't think that's the person that has the vision that's going to carry us forward for the next 40 years. And I just hope that next great leader is Republican. And on the other side, I'm sure they were looking for their side. We'll not let them worry about theirs. But I think that that's what you see going through here is an awful lot of political angst because people just don't feel that their leadership is responding to them. Paige, I want to ask you about something that I experienced. I was uh, substituting for my colleague Margaret Brennan on Face the Nation several months ago. And getting ready for that show, we did a focus group with four Trump voters. And during the course of that focus group, we did it all on Zoom. It's about 40 minutes. We cut it down to about 11 for the actual show. One of the women participants said, you know, when people come to me and they talk about democracy, I feel like that's a weapon being used against me. They define it differently than I do. I feel whenever I hear this democracy talk over and over and over again, I'm just being put down. I'm putting, being put on the defensive. And it's a, it's, it's a weapon to make me feel bad. And I, and I thought, wow, that's a very interesting perspective. I'd never encountered anyone saying to me words in that way. Yeah. That a conversation about what I thought was a unifying word, a, a word of generalized accepted concept in this country, could feel like a weapon. In your experience, in the Carter Center's experience, I, m I imagine in other countries that don't have much history, the definition of what democracy is matters. It seems like we have a contested argument now in this country about what democracy means. A challenge for us, yes? And, and absolutely. I mean, words do matter, and it becomes semantics when you have these conversations about the use of the word democracy because it's been othered. You know, I, essentially, everyone has othered somebody else. You know, that's your view, this is my view, and they, they don't match. I, you know, we have the same issue overseas. We'll do a code of conduct, and we'll ask elected officials to sign on to a code of conduct. We tried to do that in 2020, and we got some traction, but by 2022, 
we had candidate principles because we couldn't even call it a code of conduct. I mean, the candidates didn't want to be told they had a certain conduct they, that they had to aspire to. So we have candidate principles. There are five basic candidate principles that, you know, uh, honest integrity for the election, civil discourse, uh, recognizing the results. Now, these aren't enforceable, but if you can get, when the secretary signed on with his opponent, when Stacey Abrams signed on and, Brad, and Brian Kemp signed on for the gubernatorial election, when you get opponents to actually say, okay, we will adhere to something and we both respect this, you hope it brings everybody else along. But those are some of the principles of democracy, and it's the democracy deficit, as we've talked about overseas in many of these countries. But it's the democracy deficit that's happening here in the US now. And so, you know, is it civic education? Is it rule of law? How do we get to that next stage? Uh, but I think words matter. And, and when that word has been used and there's any negative connotation to democracy, you really have to scratch your head and say, well, what can we all agree on? So, you know, they're basic principles, and that's the direction we're going. Justin, you were nodding vigorously as I was asking Paige that question. Please jump in. Yeah, so I think it's, it's fundamentally a trust question. And when people are reacting to democracy, it's not because they don't like democracy. They do. And as Charles was pointed out, they very much like their own democracy, right? The local democracy they have enormous amounts of trust in. It's just those people over there. It's the othering that Paige right. talked about. Um, I think that there is a way to get back to extending trust beyond your own inner circle, but that takes immense amounts of work and it takes immense amounts of leadership from people validating the fact that you can trust more than just what you can touch, that you can trust beyond, because there are other people there who are working just as hard to make sure that it is worthy of trust. Um, I think that's right. I think we're at a place now where that's been compromised, but not irrevocably. Charles? Well, I'm, I'm resist resisting the temptation to be the political science professor here. Um, oh, please, please lean in, Charles. <laughs> but, the, but the reason is, I mean, I, so, um, I mean, I, this is not how I think about things, but I, but I also think if we're, if we're concerned about communicating with folks and getting across the idea that elections are run fairly according to the rules and run well, we need to be we, we need to, I think, actually in some ways lead into and uh, maybe even embrace some of these ambiguities with, with language. Um, and I say that because for my entire life, it's not been recent, I'm, I just turned 65, um, people have <laughs> oftentimes said, well, you know, it's not a democracy, it's a republic. And, um, and that's something that's being said more and more mm -hmm. these days. Um, and I also don't think it's a, um, it's not a coincidence that republic is close to Republican and democracy is close to Democrats. Right. And so, you know, this is going to get, you know, sucked into the vortex of the sorts of partisan um, differences that we have these days. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the two things I would say is, is on the one hand, it, I'm, I mourn the fact that the word democracy has been, has been weaponized. Um, I also think, though, that we need to take seriously, kind of re-engage, as we're re-engaging with education, re-engage with kind of civics education, and articulate the fact that we don't have plebiscitory democracies in most places. We do have a republic. We do have representatives who stand between the public and law. And um, I don't think we can dismiss entirely the pushback on the term of democracy. And for those of us who care about fair elections, you know, we do need to be concerned about our language. And maybe, unfortunately, the word democracy is something we need to um, be especially sensitive to. Secretary Thomas, have you had any experience with this? As we said at the outset, your life story is, hey, this is working. I'm, I'm a living embodiment of this. But have you encountered this I idea that, well, when you say democracy, I feel threatened, I, I feel like I'm being put down, which is exactly what this voter articulated to me I in this conversation. I certainly do. <laughs> I have faced this. Um, words do matter, but, um, you know, 
when I'm in front of certain groups, I would never say democracy. I usually say constitutional democracy or representative democracy. Um, in many of my speeches, I say whether you think you're in a democracy or republic or a constitutional democracy, um, because I try very hard to be very, you know, entirely nonpartisan. Um, but the words matter, so I've taken more of. I would say a marketing approach. <laughs> um, you know, I remind people now at the top of every speech, I say something like, when things aren't going your way, it's really easy to say the system isn't working. But that is actually how democracy works. <laughs> um, we all get to have different opinions. Some of them win out, some of them don't. Um, and you know, I think that lightens the mood a little bit. Um, so I just try to educate people and connect our democracy with values and feelings and like trust and uh, and I try to stay away from the words and I let the political scientists and the lawyers and <laughs> the advocates um, try to fight that fight. Um, I go to the fourth grade level. <laughs> Secretary Raffensperger, you also have lived experience with this. You had a primary against someone who denied the 2020 election and you went statewide and you as I remember it from your retelling of it, went to lots of small places, mm -hmm. lots of small venues, and had lots of small, but what you hoped would be important conversations. Walk us through that. Well, the first conversations have with was primarily Rotarians. Uh, they have their four-way test. Is it the truth? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Will it build goodwill? And those are great values to build on. They're really civic. They're eternal values. It's how we all want to be treated and how we should treat others. And then I would just talk about, really uh, go back in time. First of all, I'll talk about when I took office in 2019, I had nine lawsuits or more from Stacey Abrams and all of her folks that said, uh, but when not for voter suppression, I would have won this thing. And so she never conceded. And so I pushed back on that point by point. And eventually it took four years, but we finally won at trial on every single count, every, sing every single you know, alleged uh, offense that they charged us with, we won, and she didn't appeal. And then I talked about the 2020 race, and I just went through it bullet by bullet, point by point by point by point. Then I defended SB 202, because I had to do that also to set, help them. This is what we have, photo ID for all forms of voting. Lines have to be shorter than one hour. And all the metrics that we put in place. And I said, here's what the, the, the issue is at the end of the day. It gets down to integrity. And that's really what the core issue is. And I also believe that one of the issues that we have is that if you're on this side of the aisle, you need to hold your folks accountable. And if you're on this side of the aisle, you need to hold your uh, folks accountable. It doesn't do any good for you to say, hey, I'm gonna go talk to my neighbor and tell them what their, their kid's done. No, fix your own house. That's really what really works. You know, we don't need this Hatfield McCoy stuff where you point at each other. You know, fix your house, we need to fix our house and we need to hold people accountable. It gets down to integrity. And a big part of that is, that's one of the building blocks for trust. Because if you have to be truthful, you have to be honest with people, you have to have civic, you have to be respectful to each other. And when you do that and back it up with integrity and character, you know, they're just those good healthy values that, you know, that's really what the values that built this country on. And I think really any civil society have been built on those key values. Justin, I was in uh, Sedona on Friday and I interviewed Governor Katie Hobbs uh, and just before I arrived came word that Carrie Lake's attorneys had been fire, fi fined the sum of $2,000 for submitting fraudulent evidence before an Arizona court in regards to the 2022 election. And it was Governor Hobbs' observation that while that fine was important, in the larger incentive structure of denialism, it was minuscule. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that was the second, by the way, sanction uh, of the same attorney for bringing a case that was not based on evidence and making false representations to a court. Um, I don't think that's the last shoe to drop. Um, but as you point out, $2,000 is, at this point, an unfortunate cost of doing business. What's the business? Uh, the business is mm -hmm. grift. There's a lot of money to be made mm -hmm. in whipping people into a frenzy 
And I'll say that just generally, full stop, there's a lot of money to be made in whipping people into a frenzy, and people have figured out that in this context in particular, there's a lot of money to be made in whipping people into a frenzy over the election structure. Um, the amount of small dollar donations that came in in the days after the 2020 election in order to continue the fight. P.S., almost none of that money went into the legal battle. That was to line the pockets of those who were fundraising. That's unfortunately a replicable model as long as people are willing to give up their money without actually investigating where they're putting it. And that fosters the sort of extreme stances on election denialism that we see, and a $2,000 judgment isn't going to be sufficient penalty to stop it, I'll say again, yet. That wasn't the first sanction. I don't believe it's going to be the last sanction. There are a number of professional entities across the country that are taking far more serious steps to remove people who have abused the trust as an officer of the court from the opportunity to ever be an officer of the court again. I think that is, we talked about integrity and we talked about accountability. I think that's one very important step. But we won't change the broader structure until we realize that it's we who are ultimately responsible for feeding into the money machine. If the people don't want to give the money, then the money is not there to be made. You know, it, it, David started off this morning talking about the 2016 election. And there was an awful lot of concern going into the 2016 election about the potential for foreign actors to interfere with and hack our elections. It turns out we were hacked in 2016, but not through the machines, not through the registration databases, not through the change in any ballot. They hacked us. They found ways that Americans would disagree with each other and they amplified those disagreements in ways that produced or exacerbated social division. Now in 2020, the hacking's coming from inside the house. We hacked us. And these same exploitations of the division that we have are being used to fundraise, and we see that consistently. The only way to stop that will be for us to unhack us, to realize that we have to start examining the sources of information more, for us to be a little more careful with where we choose to spend our dollars, and that will, I think, cause the incentive to dissipate for people who are right now becoming awfully rich off of making everybody who works in election administration's lives more difficult. Charles, I'm gonna really rely on your native optimism here uh, to help <laughs> you, have you rather, analyze what the data and your research tells us about the potential ability for us to unhack ourselves in this space. Boy, you asked me the hardest question that you could have asked in this. I mean, I think that, so how do we unhack ourselves? Um, well, there's time, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I guess I, I, I am skeptical about a lot of commu communication strategies um, because of what, what we know in political science um, about bunking and pre-bunking and post-bunking and all those sorts of things. Um, where um, a lot of um, these sorts of activities cause people just to be more, um, you know, more skeptical about everything, both the truth and falsehoods. So I am, unfortunately, a little, a little um, not quite pet, um, optimistic about that. But it's also the case that, um, um, that election denialism and distrust can also be, um, um, can be put forward by poorly run elections. And so if I'm optimistic, <laughs> it's that I've now seen two challenging elections in a row that have been run well. And so when I say time, I think will be part of the solution. I think, and the reason I, I'm optimistic is that I'm optimistic about the ability of election officials to run trustworthy elections. And um, in many places across the country where, um, for instance, I mean, in Georgia, I mean, the evidence is that, yes, I mean, people are coming back from the brink in Georgia. People are coming back from the brink in a number of states. Unfortunately, they're not coming back in Arizona. They're not coming back in Pennsylvania. But they are coming back in other states. Mm -hmm. And they're coming back in states where you know, the evidence is the election was run well. And you're getting both parties to kind of recognize that. 
Um, and so, um, and so this comes to kind of my, you know, looking into 20, you know, 2024, I mean, it seems to me that election officials, especially in small shops, I don't know how, I don't know how, I mean, obviously, um, everyone needs to communicate what they're doing and, and educate um, people from what they're doing. Um, but I think, um, you know, running a really good election in 2024 is the important thing. Um, doing the blocking and tackling, the short lines, um, having enough ballots, getting the, getting the votes counted quickly and accurately. Those are the sorts of things I think they're going to pull us out of where we are. And the optimism is election officials have done it. Mm -hmm. um, things are challenging, but, I, but I, I've seen it done. To your point about people coming back from the brink, I see former Secretary of State Trey Grayson in the back. Uh, I know he has a theory about this, that for those who can come back, welcome them back. Mm -hmm. Do not scorn them. Do not yeah. mm -hmm. push them away. Paige, I want to ask you about something that the Carter Center has tremendous experience with, which is something that's very difficult. Going into a place where uh, an election is contested and negotiating with the top candidates beforehand, something they are oftentimes reluctant to do, say they will accept the results. Right. How hard is that? And what methods have you found most successful to achieve that? Because that seems to me to be one of the threshold orientations that has to be laid down before an election can be successfully carried out and verified and believed in. Well, uh, you know, we can walk into Liberia with blue Carter Center shirts on as observers and, you know, be the independent observers, nonpartisan. Walking into Fulton County when the Secretary of State was kind enough to invite us as the only nonpartisan observer for the risk limiting audit, we all had blue shirts on. And that was an immediate lesson to me because we were mm. put in a Democratic corner. It was like, okay, tomorrow no one wears the Carter Center shirts. You know, wear a baseball cap, but not a blue shirt. I didn't realize the color blue had been taken over. So, you know, we are slowly learning how to do things in a nonpartisan way with a name like Carter, which, mm. you know, with all the reassessment of his legacy now, still at the end of the day, he was a Democratic uh, president, president. So, when we have those conversations with elected officials, and again, this is a code of conduct that you have a conversation beforehand and say that you'll adhere to the results, you know, we're doing that here, but we have 12 principles overseas that everyone signs off on. We can only get five agreed to here and in the US. And so we will be pushing those five out because I think that they are ones that people cannot other uh, the candidates with. but. Those are difficult conversations. The secretary in, in Georgia was very wise in putting together a bipartisan task force in 2020 because he knew that we had to have voices from both sides, one telling his office what we were thinking and hearing and seeing, but also that you have to work within your communities to make sure you have trusted voices to hold your elected officials accountable. Secretary Raffensperger, I want to start with you and come all this way on the panel, so in order. Uh, look ahead to 2024. What are you, to Charles's observation about the necessity of good blocking and tackling, preparing for, looking toward, and how you want the country to evaluate this next election upcoming? Well, from our standpoint, making sure we keep lines short, making sure that we report the results quickly, I think that's really important. And then make sure the counties have the resources they need. Uh, for whoever does show up. We're, we will prepare them for a record turnout because if you look at our 18, 20, 22, uh, we, we, it's a continuous slope upward. So prepare that everyone for big numbers. And that's the best you can do. Uh, you know, other than that, uh, then be prepared for people that uh, uh, specialize in disinformation and to have be ready with a response. And I think we'll be very proactive. Uh, we have, Will you be proactive ahead of the election? Yeah, we make sure that we work with the counties. In fact, uh, we hosted uh, a seminar in Athens, you know, with all of our 159 election directors, and it's really, you know, it's for training purposes. But we want to make sure we have strong relationships with them. We know that they run the election, but at the end of the day, if things go wrong, it all comes up to Atlanta, Georgia, where I sit, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear it one way or the other. So we want to make sure all the counties prepare for big numbers. 
keep the line short. We're going to have 17 days of early voting. And as much throughput we can get on early voting helps us on election day. We just know that uh, there may be some people that won't like the results. And we hope we would be hopeful that, uh, that whatever candidates they are, they would understand that these are the results. But we can do a 100% hand recount. And I'm not uh, bashful about being able to call that card. I did it in 2020. And we did a 100% hand recount so we could prove two things. One, the machine counts were accurate because the machines did not flip the vote if you get the same answer. And those were the results. And I'm sorry that, uh, that one of the losing candidates was disappointed with it, but we had to give people, here's what the results are. Secretary Thomas. We have some unique challenges because in 2024, we will be starting early voting for the first time, yep. uh, two weeks. Uh, we also anticipate having new tabulators. Um, so there is a lot of room for mistrust. Uh, so we are trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, a lot of it will come down to human capital, uh, making sure um, in Connecticut our elections are administered on the municipal level. We have no county form of government. So it's 169 separate towns, uh, one Democrat, one Republican registrar in each town. So making sure or they have all the training they need. Uh, we've had quite a turnover in the last two years. So training, resources, and a lot of um, transparency as we take on these two huge new projects. Charles? So I, I've already um, given part of my answer. Um, um, I'll give the, um, the rest of my answer. I, I mean, the thing about 2020 was that election was the, in the emergency, break glass election. Mm -hmm. And um, we knew it was going to be challenging. Um, um, Congress didn't come through as much as we wanted, but they came through to some degree. Philanthropy came through. State and local governments came through. Anheuser-Busch came through. <laughs> uh, lots of folks came through. Just regular people came through and volunteered to be poll workers. It was seen to be a national emergency, and people, the nation, um, pulled through to make that election happen. Um, 2024 is not going to be that level of emergency, but it's still going to be a challenging election. So I guess I would say I am optimistic. The system has been stress test in the, and, and tested in the past, but there are things, and actually I'm looking at the cameras now because I know the people in this room know this, but county commissions need to be funding their county election offices, state legislatures need to be funding, need to be paying attention to the sort of legislation um, to help um, election workers be supported, to help support um, the getting out under the, the, the mountain of FOIA requests and the rest. So there's still some work to, to be done um, to make um, 2024 um, come out. Justin. Uh, I'm going to give a hearty amen to everything that Charles just said with a slightly different starting point or a slightly different analogy on the starting point. It, election officials are used to patching the holes in the bucket with duct tape. That's part of the job. In 2020, they built the entire bucket out of duct tape. There was no bucket. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think, they did a spectacular job such that people now expect every bucket to be made out of duct tape. And that is wrong, deeply wrong. The unbelievable resilience that election officials, state, county, town, local poll workers showed in 2020, I fear has taught us the wrong lesson, which is just to rely on resilience and we'll get there, which is exactly the wrong approach. Um, it's true that Congress gave emergency funding, but none of that was an investment. Yep. All of that was afterward and barely enough to keep the lights on, and in many places, not enough to keep the lights on. Philanthropy was necessary. Anheuser-Busch was necessary. And now the environment has gotten such that it's a lot harder for philanthropy, for private organizations to be able to contribute, even on a strictly nonpartisan basis, which means that county commissions have to step up, that state legislatures have to step up. And I'll say that Congress has to step up, and not in October of 2024, when it is far too late for any of that stepping up to matter. That has to be now. In fact, it has to be yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the president put forward two years ago and repeated again a $10 billion over 10-year budget 
designed to sustainably fund election administration with another $5 billion for the Postal Service in order to relieve some of the pressure on states and local administrators, not just for mail ballots, but for all of the various ways election officials know they have to use the mail and pay for the mail in order to get notice out, in order to get word out, in order to reach their constituents. And Congress responded with what can best be described as a middle finger. That has to change on a bipartisan basis. There's an enormous amount of education to be done. That is not a single party problem. That is a bipartisan problem, but a very real one if we're going to make 2024 a success. Page 2024. So I think we can all agree we thought we were standing on the precipice in 2022, and we weren't sure what was going to happen, where we were going to fall in. I think we stepped back, but we're still on the overhang. So as we look at 2024, I think there's a before, a during, and an after component that we have to focus on. Before is what many of us are working on now, and we recognize that the clock is already ticking and it's getting very short. But you know, we have to teach people to learn to discern on their media. We have to hold people accountable legally. You know, the during, you know, all of you are doing amazing work. For us, it's an observation component. How can we be effective to make sure we elevate the messages that are coming out about the free, fair elections and the transparency? And then the after, I mean, there's a lot of legal aspects now that you know, we run rule of law programs all over the world, and we run conflict mitigation programs. The work we do in Mali and Sudan, we're doing in Central Florida now on conflict resolution, mm -hmm. and the same with the rule of law. All of these frivolous lawsuits that have come forward, the judges have sent people back and said, you need to take continuing learning education credits. There are only six university professors that teach those in the United States. So you actually, we don't have a legal system that's set up or a law school system that's set up to teach election law. So we need to move into that area too. So it's a before, during, and after, and, mm -hmm. and you know, we want to be here to help all the work that's being done. Before I open it up for questions from the audience, I just want to note that if this panel has achieved nothing else, it's achieved complete metaphorical cohesion. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, Paige talked about President Carter saying he wanted to save money for a rainy day, and she's saying it was pouring rain outside, and Justin mentioning a bucket to catch rain, duct tape. Mm -hmm. So that metaphorical cohesion is absolutely perfect. Uh, it's an intimate crowd. We don't need uh, to, sh to shout or anything, but uh, raise your hand if you have a question for this distinguished panel. Yes, ma'am. Awesome panel. Thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Grace Gordon. I'm with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And uh, my question is for Secretaries Raffensperger and Thomas. Um, I'd love to hear. Oh. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship and touch points between your office and the county and local officials, election officials in your state, and how those relationships and touch points have changed um, over the past few years? Um, I'll start first because I've only been in office four months, so I can only talk about that time frame. Um, but uh, both when I was campaigning and since I've taken office, um, I really believe that those are the frontline workers. Um, and as I said, in Connecticut, we have a Republican and Democrat in every town across Connecticut. So I, whenever I'm on business anywhere, I always stop in to see the registrars. Um, I attended their conference and I took their learning or their training course, um, which uh, earned me a standing ovation <laughs> at their conference. Um, but I also started monthly calls that are not training related or specific um, you know, messages that I'm trying to push. Um, it's really an open forum. I give them updates on what the legislature is doing. I allow them to ask any questions. And um, it hasn't been done in like a decade. So um, people have been very appreciative. Um, I come from a business background. So, you know, sort of this two way communication model and continuous improvement is what I bring to the role. Um, and so far, so good. Um, because a Republican stood up at the conference and said, I've been watching you since you took office, and I wish I could go back and change my vote. So, <laughs> you know, that's the type of thing that makes me feel good as a secretary. <laughs> I'd say from our standpoint, we've had, I thought, always had good relationships with the counties, but I think we've really deepened that relationship. 
uh, we are updating with electronic poll pads, which just allow us to accelerate uh, check-in of voters. But we just don't send it out to them. We actually did some training for that. So we're always looking at what we can do. And then when we looked at the budget, we wanted $4 million for new battery packs because we use ballot marking devices. It's older battery technology, weigh over 50 pounds, and there's new ones for 30 pounds. It's like comparing a Nissan Leaf to a Tesla. And so we want to secure that. We got half of those funds so we can really help the counties run elections because we recognize the age of the average poll worker. So whatever we can do to support their efforts, we do that. And then I'd say from what I see in our election workers in our counties, they really have professionalized the organization called Gavrio in Georgia. So really working on that, elevating really the training and you know mentoring that they have county by county. So we have key leaders in, and I see that one of them is actually here at this conference, but we have these key leaders in, in po populated throughout the state. And what they're really doing is bringing in about four or five other counties where we're doing these implementations. We gather there, and we may send someone down from our office, but you know they're working together. So it's really a team approach up and down, and it's really working well. And they want, and we, I think they know that if they have issues, we have an open door policy. We're just really excited about you know our state election director. Uh, we put him in, in, the, in this office uh, right after 2020, and he's just jumped into it. But he started, you know, in the county office, then he, uh, in two county offices, and he's just elevated, you know, I think our entire uh, reach out and outreach to all of our counties. Elon, did you hear that? Tesla. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Mm -hmm. Oh, right over here. Um, hi, thank you, everybody. My name is Oh, right there you go. There's a mic right there. Oh, thank you. Um, Thank you, everybody. My name is Dohi Fasihi, and I'm with Issue One. Um, I have one question um, for, for anyone on the panel that can answer it. Um, you know, election officials are under an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of pressure, resource issues, partisan pressure at the local level right now. And these, these pressures are probably going to increase, particularly in states where um, the race is going to be quite close in 2024. What more can the federal government specifically do? to support election administrators right now ahead of 2024. Thank you. And that's for the administration and for Congress. If, just your perspective. Thank you. Justin. So I'll dive in with two things right off the bat, and I wish they were more. But uh, unfortunately, the limits on the federal government's ability to help are pretty serious, not least because not everybody wants the federal government to be helping. Um, and that is the most important thing to keep in mind is um, that help has to be welcome in order for it to do any good. Um, that said, very quickly, I think there are two plain things. One is resources, right? All of the stresses that everyone is under are exacerbated when you're trying to tie shoes with no shoelaces. And that includes security. That includes personal security, it includes system security, it includes human resources. Uh, too often we only pay attention to the budget for the machines and the paper and uh, the buildings and not the people. Um, and it is absolutely true that, as David said, a lot of people are examining whether they want to be in this heroic role. It shouldn't have to be heroic, but it has been heroic. And uh, the pay scale would help with that decision. It's not the reason anybody goes into this job, um, but undercompensating is not a good idea either. So one, two, three, four, and five are probably resources. Um, six, the FBI and the DOJ have a task force that is out there and evaluating threats against officials and hoping to deter further harassment and further threats through their efforts. That can only go so far. They are working hard, but the tools the federal government has are mostly retroactive. And there are an awful lot of people out there who have been goaded into making these sorts of threats and harassment that aren't ever going to get an FBI visit. And so um, it is important for people to know that they have real federal law enforcement who are looking after them in, in cases that rise to that level, but there's an undercurrent of things that never get to the zone of a federal crime 
that still make the job of an election official incredibly difficult. Um, things like the Election Official Legal Defense Network, I have to mention, is also helpful in this regard, right? Bipartisan support just in case you get sued uh, in a way that's frivolous or in case you're harassed or threatened. Um, but there's a lot more that states and localities will have to do to fill in the inevitable gaps that the federal government's not going to be able to reach. Secretary Raffensperger, did you feel that there were less or a shortage of tools to deal with this particular issue of threats and harassment in your state after 2020. Uh, your deputy, Gabe Sterling, gave a very famous declaration about the dangers. Mm -hmm. I know that was prompted by a particular specific tweet about someone who was in your system and the threats that they felt. Did you feel that you were under-resourced or that the law simply did not provide enough tools to combat this? I think after 2020, uh, law enforcement, I think, was probably taken by surprise. The, it, they just weren't prepared for that. And so then they're really filling in. I think now it's going into 2024. I think their eyes are wide open. But that was an issue. Would you say that in Georgia and nationwide? Probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely in Georgia. And we just had you know, uh, instances. Uh, I know that we had rural counties where we had election workers followed home, and yet it was a 75, 80, 20 county. And so it all favored, you know, uh, President Trump's, you know, team, you know, Republican team, and it's just interesting that people, even in these rural counties, I don't know why they were you know, worried about what was happening in those counties. Uh, they won 80-20. But the, you know, state law enforcement looked at a lot of things, but really the federal agencies have a lot more resources as it relates to cyber, and then also who's talking to who that state uh, entities just don't have. But we had local law enforcement patrol, you know, some of the areas where people were under threats and we're grateful for the sheriffs and the local law enforcement police departments that did that. Next question. Right over there. Hey, uh, Dave Lightman, Microsoft Democracy Forward. Um, Charles, you identified othering as one of the biggest problems in, in administration right now, right? Age, or, oh, sorry, age actually. Okay. Both of you, I mean, I think that's one of the most important things you've picked up on. We talked a lot about a mitigation in the short term, but like what's the long term solution to that? Are there, is it standardization, federal regulations, things like that? I mean, what, how do we get people to trust elections happening in other places in the U.S.? Uh, so I, we, I have a colleague here from Bridging Divides, and you know we truly are looking at how we do this overseas and how we do it domestically as well. Uh, in North Carolina, we did a bus tour, for example, and had a Republican and Democratic former mayor of Charlotte on the bus tour having those conversations. So the othering means you have to see yourself in the person that you truly believe uh, is carrying the message, that, that you're carrying the message for them, but their message is now different. So you have to be able to welcome people back to the fold when that moment happens. And you also have to show, you know, it's human nature, as, as you all were talking about what you saw in Arizona. You know, once people believe in something, you know, you're not going to talk them out of it because they've now put themselves so far out on the limb that they don't want it cut off. So you have to find a way to bring people back. And those are the conversations that really are going to change it. So you have to find specific elements that you can agree on and then move from there. And it sounds a bit Pollyannish, and I don't think you're going to change a lot of people's minds. But at least if you open up the conversation, you get to a point where the conversation's happening. And I think that's where we're missing out the, right now. The Carter Center has experience with the reconciliation yeah. part of this mm -hmm. equation too, does it not? Uh, we do, and that's why, you know, when you're, when Ebola struck in Liberia and you're trying to convince people that not to bury their dead a certain way, how do you go in and talk to religious leaders about changing generations of how they buried their dead? Well, you have to have the conversation about what it means and how it's gonna spread the disease if you do it that way. 
And so those are the type of conversations. We have to be in the communities. We can't do it from a national point. We can't do it from city and headquarters in Atlanta or from you know, the hallowed halls of universities. You actually have to be in the communities and say, what matters to them? Is it their electricity bill? Is that what they're worried about? And then you need to deconstruct that to have the conversation about where government fits into their pocketbook and where it fits into what matters to them. And a lot of work of making those connections isn't based on logic or based on convincing about facts. It's based on, on actually reducing social isolation right. and getting people to trust each other in small groups that then expands to bigger groups that then expands to bigger groups. This is the, the Surgeon General has pointed out that loneliness is a national epidemic made far worse by the pandemic and it helps breed all of the dysfunction that we're seeing and it's much easier to other somebody you don't know or have never met. But that work is incredibly hard and incredibly localized and right. very long term, how to, how to make real connections among people. And it's only ever been done in communities yeah. when it's been done well. So we've got about two minutes left. I want to give everyone a chance to offer their last observations. So Secretary Samus, we'll start with you, then Raffensperger, then we'll come this way. Ah, Thomas. Um, I just want to pick up on othering. Um, I, I, I also think it's holistic. We will not solve this problem only in the election space. And I was struck when you said that earlier, there was a time where in this country where I would not have been considered a full human being. And now I'm secretary of the state. That was not a legal solution a voting, you know, it's holistic. So I think we have to remember to make this a big tent much beyond the people in this room. And we have to attack it at the local level everywhere. Secretary Raffensperger. I think I hit that nail uh, earlier. I just come back to, it really gets down to uh, the quality of the people that are actually running for elected office. They have to be people that will stand in the gap and gently, compassionately give people the facts. And sometimes it would be blowback. And if it takes them reading Profiles and Courage to understand that everything that you say sometimes won't be gently received, you still have to do it anyway. So I think it's just being truthful with people and getting out there and talking to people. The more you talk to people, at least they then see something and, and maybe different perspectives. So having conversations. So it's about civil discourse, you know, having the character and having the courage to do that. And I think at the end of the day, uh, bit by bit, you do win people over. It just takes time. But I've never doubted the goodness of the American people. And I think if you get out there and talk to people, you'll find that most people are good, most people will listen, and uh, you can, they'll respect you for what you do. But the most important thing you can have in life, uh, and it's great to have the respect of your spouse, the respect of your kids, but it's your self-respect, because that's the person you gotta look in the mirror every morning. Charles? And these, are, these are hard things to follow. I guess the <laughs> one thing I, I, I would add um, is just, um, again, almost for, um, for, for the cameras and out there, um, election officials are ready to do their work. They've shown that they can do it under the most dire of circumstances. It's up to us as citizens. It's up to our elected officials to make sure that they're supported in the next two years. And um, so we, we have to do at least as much of our work um, um, so that um, election officials can do theirs. Justin. Yeah, that, that too is hard to follow. And I'll just, I'll add a yes and. Um, it is, there's no question that we have work to do in the next two years. Um, but we can't only think to the next two years. I think the Secretary's observation that this takes time is really important. And if we are only ever looking to solutions that kick in a few months ahead or uh, a year ahead or even two years ahead, we're going to miss the really, truly meaningful solutions that take a decade or more to develop, um, but that always yield dividends. Mm. And so we have to, even as we pick up pieces of the long-term plan that will help us over the next months and years, um, we have to commit to the long-term plan. Ben Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention saying, we have a republic if you can keep it. And that was not a two-year cycle. Paige, you get the last word. 
Yeah, so uh, following up on Ben Franklin, although he's my <laughs> boss, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter's written a lot. He's quite prolific. But one of his main takeaways was something that his high school teacher told him, which is you have to adjust to changing times but hold true to your principles. And I truly think that as we look for the right leaders to run for office, as we look to the election administrators who are spending time doing this work, you're doing really important work, and I think people understand that principled space that you're in. And so we all need to adjust and figure out how we can help you and how we can help the United States continue on this uh, journey to democracy. Before I invite you to give this panel a rousing round of applause, two observations. One, Secretary Raffensperger talked about standing in the gap. Poll workers stand in the gap. Election administrators stand in the gap. County and city supervisors do the same. So do secretaries of state. They should all be honored. And in case anyone is wondering if there's a subliminal message in my socks, yes, that's a martini glass. <laughs> Interpret it as you will. I'm Major Garrett. Please, a round of applause for this panel.